Welcome back, my friends. I am John Lovell with the Warrior Poet Society, and today we're going to be critiquing a defensive shooting. And to do so, we're going to use our Warrior Poet diagram for defensive shooting. In this diagram, basically what I've done is I've categorized three different areas, tactical, moral, and legal. And the big goal here is to evaluate the shooting in each one of these categories. So that's exactly what we're going to do. I've seen multiple people, some peers of mine that are out there in the digital space that are critiquing this gunfight. And I'm noticing things that are left out that I'm like, I need to weigh in on this. No one's saying this stuff. And so I want to be able to give my two cents. And it's not just going to let you know of like, ooh, was this okay or not okay? It should give us some learning so that if something went down when we were out and about, we would be better informed so that we could be better protectors, better warrior poets, and we could do so in a good legal moral way and a tactical way so that we can overwhelm an enemy without uh, us getting hurt, collateral damage, uh, or anyone in our family. That's the big goal. So now let's just go ahead and put it up and watch what happened. You see a robber comes in, he's got gun waving, he starts collecting cash. And you notice on the left side of the screen, the defensive shooter is fidgeting around. He is clearly drawing his gun. He's picking his moment. He fires a volley of four rounds, as far as we can tell, improves his position, fires another four rounds, and then a last round for a total of nine shots. Now, we didn't show you all the video because we are on a platform that's going to gig us for that. So you just have to hear my commentary and imagine it. And somewhere out there, you can actually see the unedited uh, version, but this will have to suffice for what we're doing today. So first, we're going to evaluate it on a tactical basis only. And I'll remind you, tactics don't care about moral and legal. Tactics just care about winning. So we're going to isolate that category. Now, what you notice is the defensive shooter doesn't immediately, like a, a Instagrammer with a shot timer, immediately jump up and draw attention to themselves. Instead, he lets it marinate, he reads the situation, and he picks his moment. He's also, instead of doing a quick draw, he's really getting it ready, moving into position, getting a gun ready, and checking in to make sure that the bad guy doesn't see what's happening. Then as soon as the bad guy passes by, he brings out gun and starts to shoot him. Now, I, I can't really tell whether anyone was behind him. I don't think so. But you also want to be able to check in with firearm safety rule number four. Know your target was beyond it, in front of it, to the left and the right of it, because I don't want those rounds going into someone else. But that's really more of the moral consideration, because what does tactics care about collateral damage? It doesn't care. It just cares about winning. But I just wanted to go ahead and throw that in. I also noticed the defensive shooter kept a reactionary gap. He didn't come right up on him. Uh, guns are violence at a distance, and so if you're a decent shooter, use space to your advantage. Bad guy never knew what hit him. He stayed in his blind spot the whole time and overwhelmed the adversary, so there was really no chance. So tactically speaking, I'll give it a good win. Now, the next category I want to jump into is the legal considerations. And the very first thing I want, want to center in on is what state are you in? Some states have a duty to retreat, in which case this doesn't look good in a state with a duty to retreat. They're going to try to crucify you for this. If you're in Washington, D.C. and you pulled this exact same thing, probably going to go very bad for the defensive shooter. Versus a state with something like a Good Samaritan law or a stand your ground law like Texas has, you're going to be sitting much, much better. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so take all this for what it worth. I'm really just asking questions here is, did the defensive shooter have fear of imminent death or bodily harm? If a reasonable person was in the same scenario, would they fear for their lives or the lives of someone else or to have serious bodily harm? Now, you could say because the bad guy's waving around and pointing a gun at everyone, well, that shows it. I'm like, well, was he leaving the store with just money. This is stuff that a prosecution of defense is going to have to hash out. But all the def defensive shooter has to prove is that, hey, I feared for my life and the lives of other people. I believed that that was going to go down. And as long as that's good, they may be good. Now, in a court of law, as I understand it, it's not really about what happened. It's about how you articulate it in a court of law, which is sneaky. If, like it comes down to the judge and the jury and how into this case is the media and how much social pressure. You saw the Rittenhouse case and the facts were pretty plain, but it drug on and on because all of this media pressure and all this hype. And so you never really know how stuff's going to go uh, in front of a jury of your peers. And so 
I don't know, but it's considerations that are legal that are have to be sorted through. Now, a third legal consideration is, is the defensive shooter shooting to kill or is he shooting to stop the threat? Now, in defensive shooting, we're supposed to shoot to stop the threat. That's the correct way to uh, think about it. But that last shot, shot number nine, a prosecutor may jump all over that and say, hey, he wasn't moving. Now, some uh, the defense would say, no, he was moving. He flinched and he thought he was making the grab for the gun. But the prosecution say, hey, if, like you were executing him. You were murdering him. He was down and out. He was no harm to anyone and you execute him. That could be some game that the prosecution plays and we don't know how that would go. Now, this can be further complicated because the defensive shooter did shoot him in the back, which you can actually do in a defensive shooting scenario. It's a myth to say you cannot shoot someone in the back. You can, it all just depends. Uh, I mean, if they're gonna like, I'm gonna kill you, let me get my gun. And they grab their gun and they turn around and like, you shot him in the back for it. I'm like, nope, that could still be a clean shoot. So just cause you shot him in the back doesn't necessarily mean bad play. Now, two other legal complications is, is the defensive shooter didn't stick around. Like if I got in a fender bender with somebody, I would stick around to talk to the cops and there's gonna be an insurance claim. I would stick around. We also found out after the fact that the bad guy, the, the robber's gun was a fake gun. Now, some folks who don't know anything about justifiable shoots, concealed carry, and any defensive laws may say immediately like, hey, a guy with a gun shot an unarmed robber. I'm like, no, no, no. If the good guy thought that the bad guy's gun was real, it's good. The only way that the fake gun becomes this awful consideration is if the good guy admits that he knew the bad guy had a fake gun. If he does that, now that should probably change stuff. Again, not a lawyer, but I'm anticipating uh, what some of the questions are gonna come up in court. Now I wanna move into the moral category. So far we've talked about tactics. I'm gonna give the guy a thumbs up. Good job, good use of tactics. Legal, eh, I'm not so sure. We'll see how it plays out. Morally speaking, I've got a problem with this. It looked to me like the guy was leaving. I don't know. I have no audio. I don't know what was going to happen. There's a lot of people in this world uh, that, you know, the robbery is the excuse, but really they just want to distribute mayhem. They, they want to do awful things. And so I don't want to armchair quarterback this and say, if I was there, I do X, Y, and Z. I know too much about training and stress and fear and how it can really distort your view of the world. But morally speaking, I'm going to have to look back on that event and say, I killed that person over defending property? Or did I did I kill that person and I really saved a life? Now, if I killed that person and they didn't really need killing, I don't know how well I'm going to recover from that. Now, in a clean shoot, I've done just fine. I have shot terrorists in the past and I lost zero sleep. No sleep was lost uh, for me. I've never even felt bad about extricating Al Qaeda from this planet. Never did. But if I accidentally shot a good guy or an innocent or, or a, a little Afghani kid, I don't think I'd recover from that. Warrior poets were protectors of the innocent. We love people and that's why we defend. It's not that we want to go kill someone just because we can do it and get away with it. It's because we want to safeguard life. That's what we do. Warrior poets live for higher purpose, ready to sacrifice in the defense of others, not warmongering, bloodthirsty savages. So this guy's going to have to answer that question. Did I shoot him for a few bucks and some wallets? And I can't answer that question. I wasn't there. I don't know, but that's a big deal to me. Whenever you have to think about whether you're going to pull a gun and defend yourself or other people, you're always going to have to contend with the warrior poet diagram for defensive shooting, tactical, moral, and legal. I want to hear from you guys in the, uh, in the comments, what I gave them as uh, basically is this overall score. According to this little diagram is Thumbs up for tactics. I'm kind of neutral for legal, but if it tilts anywhere, it's kind of, yeah, th uh, th more yes than no, but a little bit more neutral. And then for moral, I'm, I'm thumbs down uh, just based on what I'm seeing. And again, it's imperfect knowledge and information here. That's where I stand. I'd like to know where you stand though.
So there you have it, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hey, if you'd like to support the channel and our Warrior Poet movement, please consider checking out warriorpoetsociety.com. We've got a just buffet, a curated section of all things tactical and body armor and belts and bags and knives and all kinds of cool stuff. Additionally, we have a streaming service, watchwpsn.com, all of our content and shows and training classes. If you want to get trained, watchwpsn.com. Appreciate you guys. Subscribe like, share, all the things. Train hard, train smart. Stay free.